The world is not a random assortment of facts, existing in a vacuum independently from one another. Knowledge isn't just a random assortment of facts floating in your head. The act of integrating is fundamental to knowledge. In order to understand something, we must know its characteristics and utilities. We must know how it is related to other things. With the first official episode of the Integrating Podcast, outside of the Orientation Podcast, I want to take time to talk about an issue that is near and dear to me. An issue that has the potential to waste a massive amount of resources, bankrupt economies, and cost countless lives. This issue has the potential to destroy communities. It has secondary consequences that are almost never considered as well. Something in my mind that further illustrates the horrors of war goes beyond the loss of human life at the foreground. I think about what it would be like to die from war. I don't just imagine the combatants. I think about what it must be like to be collateral damage in a conflict. Imagine not dying right off the bat, but suffering in the most horrendous and painful way imaginable. It has to be frightening. This is why I wanted to do a podcast about war in relation to the events pertaining to the end of 2019 and start of 2020, especially keeping in mind Donald Trump's actions against Iran. War is is very serious. I think the war issue is far more important than any sort of individual instance of racism in the United States. I hope through this podcast, this specific podcast, that you and I both learn something. I hope I am able to integrate several ideas together, thus creating stronger and more conceptual ideas in my mind that will benefit me later down the line, both intellectually, well, and just as a person in general, who has more knowledge to apply to the world. Hello everybody, welcome to the Integrating Podcast. Um, Today I want to talk about foreign policy, because this is a heavily contested topic There are many sides to uh, foreign policy, different beliefs, different angles of coming at it, and I want to talk about the different sides, and this is ultimately, I think, one of the best examples of integrating different things, because there's a lot of historical and political events, as well as different ideologies at play here. I want to talk about history and how it connects with the current events and, of course, what people believe. So, first of all, I want to talk about war. In general, I want to establish um, foreign policy, again, specifically war, and I want to talk about the importance of talking about war over almost every other issue that is being talked about in American politics. So, first of all, is war ever necessary? So, to me, this is one of the most important questions everybody should ask. There is a great quote from Ron Paul, from his book, Liberty Defined. A foreign policy that endorses worldwide intervention and occupation requires that people live in perpetual fear of supposed enemies. So in other words, with the existence of war, in order to get the people to support war, because I think generally speaking, when there's no distractions, I think you can convince almost anybody that war is not necessary, that war is negative, especially when you start talking about the many different facets that it interferes with. 
the consequences of war. So in order for there to be war, there must be an enemy. A government looking to grow its influence will exploit this, which plays directly back into the quote by Ron Paul. But what if there is an enemy? So that's a question that is genuine that I think we should consider when talking about foreign policy. So maybe Ron Paul is wrong. Maybe somebody else is right. Well, we'll see. <clears throat> So why should we talk about war? war? Well, you know, why should we talk about it? Okay, why should we concentrate so much on the topic of war? Well, it is the legal killing of human beings. It, it costs human life, economic productivity. It takes people from home and sends them abroad, and etc., so this is what I meant by the different facets that war affects. And that war has a direct... These are direct... These are things that feel the effects of war. So, not only that, but the United States government can assassinate anyone declared an enemy combatant. So, there's a quote from Dennis C. Blair, who was testifying before Congress. He is the former... Director of National Intelligence. He served under Barack Obama. Uh, he does have a previous military background. But he's quoted as saying, Being a U.S. citizen will not spare an American from getting assassinated by military or intelligence operatives. Now, for the sake of clarity, do go look up the quote. There is some other stuff. Like it, It's a longer sentence. I omitted some stuff before and I omitted some stuff afterwards. I'm saying this for clarity. You can look up the quote, the surrounding uh, words around the quote. I only omitted them because I wanted to make this specific point about this general principle underlying that sentence. But he did add a add a extra context, saying that you know you will be considered an enemy combatant if you meet X Y Z criteria. But X Y Z criteria is if you're supposedly planning an enemy attack, or, uh, sorry, an attack, well, yeah, an enemy attack, an attack against the United States, which, <clears throat> fine, that sounds good, but note, so here's an example of an American citizen being assassinated, Anwar al-Awlaki, so, <coughs> was assassinated without due process in Yemen. By the Obama administration. Now, was he planning on attacking American citizens? Maybe. But is that the point? No. The point is, regardless of the crime he did or was planning to do, there was no due, no due process. He was an American citizen. Doesn't matter where he was at the time, he was an American citizen. So I, I ask myself the question when talking about this. Let's say there was undeniable proof. That he was going to do an attack against the United States. Would it be justifiable to kill military targets without due process? And I say, sure. Uh, but, when we're talking about the idea of due process, to me, a declaration of war should satisfy due process critics. But this was an American, and no standard of due process was satisfied under then it being at the whim of the president, which is unconstitutional. In the days before a CIA drone strike, there's more, by the way, it doesn't end there. In the days before a CIA drone strike killed Al-Qaeda operative Anwar al-Awlaki last month, allegedly, his 16-year-old son ran away from the home in Yemen's capital of Sana to try to find him, relatives say, when he too was killed in a U.S. airstrike Friday. The Alaki family decided to speak out for the first time since the attacks. I omitted the quote. You can look this up yourself. Links will be in the description box below. The teenager, Abdurrahman Al-Alaki, I probably slaughtered that, <laughs> but whatever. A U.S. citizen was born who, who was born in Denver... In 1995, and a 17-year-old Yemeni cousin were killed in a U.S. military strike that left the nine people dead in southeastern Yemen. So, my point is, to make it clear, it's not that we shouldn't kill threats against American citizens. 
But it's the fact that the government decides who is considered a threat. And the criteria, while laid out in the Patriot Act, it's pretty broad. It could be a rioting that goes a little too far, but hasn't actually posed a threat. <clears throat> As Ron Paul says in his book, Liberty Defined, the war on terror is an amorphous phrase because it can be twisted and bent to mean almost anything. <clears throat> we have had examples of American citizens being denied their right of due process in every single political ideology from left to right in the United States in some way or another has advocated policy that would render due process basically null. At this point, it's just a suggestion. Should we kill terrorists? Maybe, yes, sure, why not? But, again, there's no declaration of war, which to me would satisfy the due process, that idea of due process, because it's debated, evidence is presented by the president, and then the president can then enforce that due process, the, the consequence of whatever is going to happen. And then, of course, there's due process as we understand it in our legal system, especially when we're talking about American citizens being accused of crimes. So let's talk about the different views on war, and I think this will help sort of seal my message or make it clear what I'm trying to say when we talk about the different views on war. So first, we have the neoconservative foreign policy, which this is a broad category of um, a sort of movement view on war. So there's no justification that won't be used to expand American influence abroad via military. So you'll hear bleeding heart arguments. We should help them. We should stop this genocide. You might hear more honest justifications such as a need for resources oil interests, taking oil, or uh, trying to establish a government that would be more willing to trade or buy oil or sell us oil or whatever it is. Influence in the more general term, because I think when influence can incorporate resources and of course different political things, but influence I think is a good, just like a good uh, thing to put in there to you know, for what a neoconservative might argue is a justifiable excuse to go to war. Um, Counterterrorism, so that goes back to the war on terror, um, defending allies, and so on. And maybe you think that some of those are okay. I'm, I'm trying to uh, paint a picture about neoconservative foreign policy in a neutral light. So I'm not saying... You know, maybe you are convinced by bleeding heart arguments. Maybe you're convinced by, you know, we do need resources or we should be concerned about terrorism or we should defend allies. This is me broadly putting it in. Basically, though, a neoconservative, what separates them is they're motivated by political power. And that's not to say that they can't believe some of their bleeding heart arguments. What separates a neoconservative from somebody who is only concerned with bleeding heart arguments is neoconservatives typically always use any excuse available to start any war that they have an interest in starting. You look at John McCain, you look at somebody like Mitt Romney, they have over and over again used, well, specifically John McCain, because he's been in politics forever before his uh, untimely death. He supported so many wars based on so many justifications so to me that is a perfect epitome of what it means to be a neoconservative so let's talk about the bleeding heart foreign policy so this is a subcategory of the more broad support for war <clears throat> um this is very specific because again bleeding heart arguments are used by neoconservatives so I'd say a bleeding heart foreign policy, it can be included, it could be described as humanitarians with guillotines. They favor intervention in foreign genocides, because that's a moral position that they are taking. They are in favor of finding a moral side in a civil 
war. They favor generous foreign aid, meaning they will throw money at any conflict as long as it's based on their moral bleeding heart position. And they favor nation building because after you, you know, uh, help uh, rebels take over or overthrow their government, you, you know, intervene in any way whatsoever, you might as well stick around and help them build the nation. So, another specific subcategory is an imperial foreign policy. So, again, this is this fits right in to the neoconservative framework, but it is separate from the bleeding heart framework in that it is all about expanding influence. So, nation building, conquering land, and so on. And there's a lot of conservatives, even some who I like, and I'm not going to name drop anybody, um who will say something like America is one of the most generous generous countries in the entire world. Well, that's because from my perspective, the United States has a very neoconservative foreign policy. There has been so many reasons and excuses. I'm not even going to talk about the military industrial complex today. But there has been so many justifications to start so many wars. But don't be fooled by conservatives, again, some who I like, who refuse to identify modern imperialism. So again, they'll say, the United States is the only country that destroys another country, but gives them their land back. But that's not the definition of imperialism. The definition of imperialism is a policy of extending a country's power and influence through diplomacy or military force. So they, they're, they try to sort of pinpoint, pigeonholed something like the British Empire as imperialism. But the United States isn't imperialist because they're not actively seeking out colonies. And the definition of imperialism does not mean that you have to have colonies or that you directly control an area. It is about expanding your influence so uh one of the best ways to to really show this is so let's continue on this can be as simple as arming rebels in a civil war as the idea is that rebels will establish a government friendly to the supplier of arms of military uh, support thus expanding influence you establish this new government you're arming one side at the expense of another side. You are directly trying to expand your influence. So let's say that... Let's, let's just take the American Revolution and tweak the history a bit to make an analogy. So as we understand it, the United States, the 13 colonies, were British colonies. Let's say in this alternate universe... They are not British colonies, per se, but they are colonies that were established by, you know, British settlers, therefore have a very close relationship to the British. Therefore, whatever the Queen says there, due to, out of their respect for the British, they decide to, 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 you know, do what the British say. And if they don't, and they try to rebel, then the British will come over and annihilate them or overthrow them with some sort of rebel group. They will fund a group in order to keep influence in that region. That is an example of imperialism. That, that's an analogy that would explain imperial, imperialism. So we there will be an actual historical example that I will give in this podcast, so don't think I'm just making up history to try to, uh, don't think I'm altering history to try to make my point because I can't point out any real world examples. I will, which is uh, where we'll sort of connect historical events which have had consequences now. So let's talk about an objectivist foreign policy. So objectivists, generally speaking, well, objectivism is the philosophy as espoused by Ayn Rand. It has answers in metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, aesthetics, politics, and so on. 
Um, and there's a very specific way that they view foreign policy. And the way they view foreign policy is they think defending America's interest is something that is a value. It's an ethic. Not America's interests in, like, there's oil over there. We need oil, so let's go completely annihilate that country. But the way they would define America's interest is if attacked, attack back. Obliterate the enemy. Obliterate a threat. However, no no national built, no nation building. You send a message. If you attack us, it will be the last thing that you do. Um, they would agree with selling arms to your allies. So, you know, the United States has a vested interest in selling arms to Canada or the United Kingdom if these countries were ever under threat. So, an objectivist foreign policy is very much about if there's a threat against you, you can take military action against it. Even if you are not attacked. Something I should have made clear. Uh... Which I will actually later on in the podcast explain, but let's continue. So let's talk about libertarian foreign policy. A lot of time people try to muddle libertarian or objectivists. Some libertarians are fans of Ayn Rand, but they're not necessarily objectivists. Some objectivists might take the libertarian label because it closely fits, but there are major differences between libertarians and objectivists. And do note that I am talking about small L libertarians. I'm not talking about the libertarian party because libertarianism was a conceptual idea in many forms before the libertarian party. So it's simple. If attacked, attack back. Um, They believe that interventionism typically has consequences. This is blowback theory. I only wanted to sum it up just basically because libertarian ideas are kind of broad especially in the small small l sense there are some pacifist libertarians but i think the general idea would be if attacked attack back and don't intervene in countries conflicts because you'll create enemies it's basically what i said were consequences of war before it hinders economic productivity and costs lives, does more harm than good. That's the pragmatic argument. Or they might just identify it as it's just basically slaughter. War is slaughter. <clears throat> I don't think, I don't, I know that a libertarian, generally, general libertarians, the broader movement, most libertarians, even anarcho capitalists, would have no problem with you defending yourself if a foreign army invaded. So, a pacifist foreign policy. So, war is never justified. It is better to peacefully resist protest than it is to partake in war. These people probably worship the heck out of Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. And I understand uh, war is damaging, but at no cost can we have war. So I think now I've basically covered what I think the different war positions are. Maybe there's more subcategories, maybe there's more broad categories that I overlooked, but that's the general gist, and that's generally what we see in American politics, and I think even throughout the world, and some are uh, practiced more than others. So where do I personally fall? And the reason why I'm going to give this is before I talk about more current events. I want to make sure that all my biases, beliefs are clear. So I fall somewhere between adopting an objectivist view and a libertarian, small l libertarian view of foreign policy. So let me start out with where I disagree with libertarians. I don't think you need to be attacked in order to use military force. And I'm sure there's probably, I, I would imagine there's a lot of small l libertarians that would agree with me on this point. That you don't necessarily need to be attacked in order to use a military force. But I think that's the general principle among small l libertarians is that I should never initiate an act of aggression. But of course I think some of them, if not a lot of them, would agree that aggression doesn't necessarily you know, need to be 
initiated with, you know, the military. It could be through sanctions. It could be a very legitimate threat made. Um, if in Canada it was invaded, I would have no problem with the American federal government arming Canadian rebels to fight off an invading army. I think... Uh, having a friendly country to the north that is a western country, much like the United States is a western country. There's huge differences. I'm not implying that Canada and the United States are the same. There's differences in culture and obviously the uh, branch of philosophy of politics, the way they both established themselves. Their initial founding history, I think, is completely different, although there are certain similarities. Of course, I think Canada... Is probably the closest thing the United States has to a sibling. And you share a common lineage from the British, whatever. It, uh, Canada, in my opinion, to you know, basically surmise what I'm trying to say, to say succinctly, is that Canada is an alternate history United States. It's what the United States could have been if they kissed the ring rather than rebelled. Um, libertarians are generally, in my opinion, too influenced by their anarchist wing. Again, who I like, but, you know, Murray Rothbard, somebody who I respect immensely, one of the best political philosophers in the entire world, and if you're reading Anatomy of the State, he, I think to summarize what he said, he basically says that, you know, war is the health of the state. The state relies on war to keep power and influence, and he's not wrong. But again, I'm not an anarchist, and I. And this is something I struggle with. Because I'm being pulled towards, you know, anarchism by Murray Rothbard, but then I have my minarchist Ayn Rand view. Of, of politics that has been influencing me and her philosophy. And I'm a fan of Ron Paul. Ron Paul is one of those who kind of um, drifts between the anarchist and minarchist camps. You know, he finds respect from both sides. It's just, it, it is something I'm struggling with internally. Because I understand anarchists, but I just, I, their foreign policy... While I agree on principle, and I think they make very good points, I just can't go the distance. I think libertarians are too influenced by some of their anarchist counterparts. Um, so, where do I disagree with objectivists? So, I don't romanticize American foreign policy the way that objectivists do. They have a tendency to refuse to accept blowback theory. There is no possible way that any of the terrorism that the United States sees today has anything whatsoever to do with American foreign policy and its history of actions in the Middle East. To me, I think that is absurd. Maybe there are objectivists who do say that, but among the objectivists who I respect, like Ayn Rand, you know, Rucka Rucka Ali, Yaron Brook, never once have they declared or accepted blowback theory. When you talk about uh, terrorists having motives, it's, well, ha, yeah, they always try to paint that, you know, the terrorists had a hard life and therefore they're doing this. And I get why an objectivist might feel that way because they strongly believe in free will, but objectivists don't deny influence from other people or, or, you know, motives, reactionary motives. They don't deny that that exists, so it confuses me, and this is a major point of contention I have with objectivists, is that they refuse to accept that American foreign policy has influenced the current predicament that we're in right now. I think it is absurd. I think they are a little too comfortable with using military force against threats. I've seen many objectivists state that we should declare war on North Korea because they are actively threatening us. And who knows what could happen if they perfect their nuclear capabilities. I'm not comfortable with that. Now, I would support... And they're really comfortable with wanting to declare war on Iran because they adopt that view that Iran is a sponsor of terrorism. 
Libertarians, however, and there, again, there's similarities between libertarians and objectivists, but foreign policy is one of those issues where they almost do not agree. I don't think I, I don't think there's any evidence that Iran is a major supporter of terrorism. Saudi Arabia, on the other hand, I think, is definitely a supporter of terrorism. I'm not quite clear where objectivists line up on Saudi Arabia. Um, I think they would support declaring war on Saudi Arabia. But that's th this is basically where I disagree with objectivists. I think their principle. What I want to say, I'll make this succinct. This is what I believe about objectivist foreign policy. Their principles are one hundred percent accurate when it comes to foreign policy, but their application of those principles is strange to me in many ways. So. What I like from both camps, I like that objectivists have a no-holds-barred view of foreign policy. If there's a legitimate threat, annihilate your enemy with any means necessary and appropriate. Meaning there's not going to be this, oh, we killed people with nukes, oh my god. I mean, from my perspective, I think the United States made a huge mistake going into World War One and going into World War Two. World War Two wasn't to stop the Nazis and to save the Jews. And it wasn't because we were brought into the conflict because of Pearl Harbor. The United States put oil sanctions on Japan, which is, in my opinion, definitely a declaration of war. I'm not saying the United States deserved the attack or United States uh, military members deserved to die. I'm not saying that at all. But just like how you would with a murder, you would try to discover the motive. That is what we're trying to do with foreign policy, which objectivists oftentimes, again, fall short on this aspect, but I do like their attitude in applying war. You know, if, if you need to, you go into a country, you drag every man, woman, and child out of their houses and show them the dead soldiers that you just killed and say that if you want to start a war, this is what it will come to. Don't ever do it again. And then leave. You, know, you will do whatever is necessary. And this is one thing that I, I strongly disagree with libertarians about is you never terrorize the civilian population. If you're in war from a country that has declared war and there's a civilian population that supports their government, they're f I'm not saying killing civilians. I'm saying you show them what will happen if they support regimes that want to support war against the United States. That's what I love about objectivists. They have balls. But what I like from libertarians is that they seem to be on this issue more intellectual than objectivists. They seem to be more integrated on this aspect than I think objectivists are when it comes to consequences. I like that libertarians accept a blowback. And I like that they are non-interventionist. I think... I, I, not objectivists aren't advocating for a huge interventionist foreign policy, and I like that quite a bit. Um, I think again to succinctly say it and then put the point to rest is I think objectivist principles, as far as foreign policy goes, is superior. But I think libertarians were recognizing certain historical events that impact the future, such as blowback, that being a perfect example of this conceptual idea of our previous foreign policy having an influence on what happens. I think that is superior. So if you could take the view of historical events from the libertarians and put it with the principles from objectivists, I think that is where you get the best foreign policy combination of the two different but similar ideologies. So let's talk about recent events as far as it pertains to, or as it pertains to Iran, the most recent sort of events, at least as I record this podcast, which will probably still be relevant even when I upload this now. Iran. 
so what, what do we know so far? Well, the uh, an Iraqi Shiite militia or supporters attacked a U.S. embassy compound in Baghdad. Um, the United States retaliated on January 3rd, 2012 which led to the assassination of General Qassam Soleimani, I think that's how you pronounce it, Soleimani. Of course, this caused a bunch of political strife, uh, a divide, if you will. And we know that Iran retaliated from, or on January 8th, 2012, Iran launched more than 20 missiles at two military bases that housed thousands of Iraqi and American servicemen and women, no Americans were killed, although Iran claims that Americans were killed, but it doesn't appear that that is entirely accurate. There seems to be this this idea that Iran initiated this war as if history began five minutes ago, when in reality, current tensions with Iran is one of the best examples of blowback caused by inappropriate, short-sighted foreign policy. So when did this begin? What am I talking about? Well, in 1953, Iran had a democratically elected prime minister, Mohammad Mossadegh. And he nationalized British oil interests in the country, and the British had no idea how to combat this or respond to it. So what happened? Well, the British asked for help from the CIA. So President Eisenhower approved a CIA operation backed by the British that overthrew the elected leader of Iran, again, Mohammad Mossadegh, and replaced him with the Shah of Iran, who is known as one of the most brutal dictators in world history. Maybe not the worst dictator. And this is related to the Iranian hostage situation when Jimmy Carter was uh, finishing his first term as president, which ultimately, I think, was a caveat to Ronald Reagan becoming elected. So in order to ensure that the Shah, you know, the leader established or implemented by the United Kingdom and the United States CIA was that they helped create and train basically a CIA police sanctioned police for SAVAK or S-A-V-A-K which was responsible for the detention, torture, oppression, and state-sponsored terror. So we're beginning to see something here that Iran isn't just the aggressor. You could say that, you know, maybe what they were doing was going to have negative influences on uh, the United Kingdom. Maybe you could come up with an argument stating that, but as far as military action or really, really shady action, it's clear here who did what first to initiate tensions. So in 1979, the Iranian people revolted against the Shah and overthrew him. And in 1979, that same year, the CIA and Pentagon began supporting an anti-Iran Iraqi dictator, Saddam Hussein. Ultimately, this led to a war between Iran and Iraq. And the United States and Israel began launching airstrikes against militias on December 27th. So this is this is more recent history. Uh, actually, let me let me go back. Um, around this time against Iran was when the United States and the CIA sold weapons to Saddam Hussein. The same weapons that would be used as a justification to possibly go into Iraq. So. This is, let's get into more recent history, which will play into the most recent events with Iran. So the United States and Israel began launching airstrikes against militias until on December 27th, this is 2019, a militia attacked back with rockets at United States bases that killed a contractor and wounded two American soldiers. It has yet to be confirmed if this was an Iraq or an Iran backed militia till this till till now till when I'm recording this, which is February 4th, still no evidence that this militia group was backed by Iran. And not only that, but there's evidence to suggest that this militia group was attacked first. So this is when the United States retaliated by attacking Khatib, Hezbollah, and killing around 25, which sparked the Baghdad riots. After this, the Iranian general was assassinated. And then obviously the assassination is what led us to now, where you have even more of a political divide. It seems like every single issue, although 
I will say, I am proud of the left for finally holding an anti-war protest. It's been almost 11 years since they've shown up. But in reality, it seems as if, from my perspective, there's a bit of a cognitive dissonance because... Or, or a bit of a confirmation bias because there wasn't that much protest to wars started by Obama or assassinations like the assassination I mentioned previously. This wasn't even a general, yet there was no outcry unless you were, of course, a libertarian. Uh, I don't even know if the most maybe Green Party type progressives who hate the democratic establishment, the, the more consistent branch of anti-war progressivism. Other than that, it's they were almost completely silent. So I do applaud them for coming out again and finally protesting. Um, but this is a great, great example of having a foreign policy that is controlled by neoconservatives and, well, special interests. The... So this brings me to the military-industrial complex. <sighs> it's a tricky subject because I don't deny that there is a, an alliance between weapons manufacturers and the government, but I think it's a little too simple to say that it's specifically just the military-industrial complex because how many people support war? How many people do you know who supported the assassination of the Iranian military general? A lot of people, even some liberty advocates I know who, who, anytime you criticize the assassination, they will instantly levy at your feet the accusation that you are defending the, the general, that you are somehow an apologist. To me, that is, is bizarre. It's inaccurate as well, because it's not that I am concerned about this specific general dying i'm 100 percent sure that or i have no problem accepting that he was a tyrant or that he did things that were worthy of punishment the assassination was illegal there was no due process or there was no constitutional requirement or um, um justification there certainly wasn't a national security risk that wasn't inherently caused by previous u.s foreign policy or i should say it wasn't constitutionally sound Congress didn't approve, but as we know, most of the Republicans would have probably accepted this and may make excuses for it, and we know that most of the Democrats are going to exploit this because it's not their president who is <laughs> the one uh, carrying out the, the uh, assassinations, but if you believed that this was, you know, an I Iranian started war, I hope you now realize that that's not the case. What was my initial point? Oh yeah, sorry, I got distracted. I was going to talk about the military-industrial complex a little bit, giving my initial thoughts. So in regards to the military-industrial complex, I believe it's real. I don't deny it, but I think there's much more. I don't think you can sum up our foreign policy and just say, oh, it's a military-industrial complex. What about... Oh yeah, no, no, that was my point. I talked about how many people do you know that supported the assassination? So many people, even typically people who are skeptical of interventionism. The culture and the philosophy of the individual voters has to change before we will see any major change in politics. And it's a multifaceted answer. I don't think just electing the right politicians is the way to go. It's also holding politicians accountable, holding your representatives accountable. It's civil disobedience. It's protest. It's petitioning. But in order to get to that place first, well, it's it's also before before I say that, it's also completely understanding what the role of government should actually be, not only domestically, but foreign. But before any of that is possible, you have to reassess your philosophical convictions. What are your ethics? Um, what are your politics? Why are your politics that way? Does it contradict your ethics? What should we be striving for? Am I being deceived? These are all things that need to be considered. 
before we see any major change. Otherwise, the way I see it, it's going to be exactly the same. We, we're in this back and forth, you know, they kill some people, we kill some people, there's some tensions, the media blows up, both sides dig their heels in, and nothing happens because when the other guy is in from the other side, it's just going to be reversed. So that's what I wanted to talk about. So I-